my presentation today is on the performance of ESG. And I'm going to share some exciting new research that we've launched that seeks to answer the three questions we have on the screen. So the first one, what ESG metrics impact risk and returns at the industry level? I think this is one of the main unanswered questions we have today, or debated questions. We're then going to hone in on climate metrics and ask the question, are there any performance drivers there? And then lastly, we're going to look at what drives ESG stock selection. And again, ask the question, is this the same as what drives performance? Sneak peek, it's not, leading to many risks and also opportunities. But before that, just a quick introduction. So my name is Shaheen Contractor. I cover ESG for Bloomberg Intelligence, which is Bloomberg's research team. I describe my job as sort of taking Bloomberg's ESG data and providing analysis into it, so writing about trends, drivers across many topics, climate, gender, uh, and of course, ESG performance, which I'm excited to show today. So let's come to our first research question. What ESG factors or metrics impact risk and returns? Now, I think everybody here knows that when it comes to ESG, there are often a hundred different metrics that can impact a given company or industry, right? And the question is, out of this, what really drives performance or can drive performance? And that's what we seek to answer. So just as, as an example here, I have our Bloomberg ESG scores for a mining company. And you can see about we're scoring about 15 different issues. And beneath this is about 150 different metrics. I actually stopped counting at 150, so there's more. So the breadth of this really begs the question, what ends up impacting returns? So today I'm going to showcase some results from the materials industry. So think chemicals, mining. We're going to use that as a case study. But just know that we've done this for multiple other sectors, multiple other industries. And we'll soon be covering all. So a lot more to come for you, a lot of sleepless nights for me. But let's dig into some of our results. And we're going to start with ENS metrics uh, for, for these materials industries. Now, what we found is over our six and a half year back test, we found that within industries like chemicals and mining, the metric that really seemed to drive out performance was our health and safety issue scores. Now, this is a key piece of our Bloomberg social scores. Right? So if you look at the chart to the right, you can see companies with better health and safety scores are outperforming those with worse health and safety scores. And this, this value is a minimum of about 3.5% annually, so not, you know, not something that's small. If we look at the left, we can see all the issues that we're testing, so things like energy management, GHG emissions. And the chart is really asking the question, are returns better for better scoring companies? You can see the yes, no, and if so, by how much. So again, you'll see it's really health and safety that has got the, I guess, the, the biggest benefit over there. So health and safety for chemicals and mining. But what about governance? Are there any performance drivers there? So when it comes to governance, we actually found there was no performance driver. But the main benefit was in reducing drawdowns. In other words, I think of this as reducing downside risk. Think of drawdowns as sort of the maximum your portfolio can lose over a period of time. And I think this makes sense, right? Because when you think of governance, you think of these large one-off events that can happen from poor board oversight or poor audit governance, things like that. Now, you can see here for all, the, for all these materials industries, we've tested our Bloomberg governance score and then its components. So we have board composition, executive compensation, et cetera. But what I find interesting is the biggest benefit that we see is within the shareholder rights issue category. And we can see that across all industries, drawdowns for better scoring companies are lower by at least 5%. And I say at least 5% because I think 5% is substantial enough. The, others, the other issues you can see vary a little bit are not that consistent. And again, I think this makes sense, right? If you think of companies with poor shareholder rights, I think that can exasperate underperformance if the company is mismanaged. And the classic example I have is of Facebook, well, now Meta, but when the Cambridge Analytical scandal broke, no shareholder could really do anything because Zuckerberg controlled all the voting power. And hence, Facebook 
continued to underperform. So it's when a company is mismanaged that poor shareholder rights can really exasperate underperformance, and that's what we see in our quantitative analysis, at least. So let's flip into climate metrics. Now, just a note, we previously looked at scores. We're now going to dig into underlying metrics. Uh, slightly more objective, but I'll stop there. So we found that within some of the most resource intensive industries, so steel, aluminum, cement, we found carbon intensity to be a driver of performance. So here you can see companies with a lower carbon intensity are outperforming those with a higher carbon intensity. And uh, I won't spit out numbers, but for something like steel, for example, it's about, I think, something around 8% per year over our, this is a five and a half year back test. And I'll mention that, you know, all these back tests, they're region neutral, size neutral, beta neutral. So I won't go into details, but we're trying to control for as much as we can that might drive things other than these factors that we're testing. <clears throat> So for steel, for example, again, I think this makes intuitive sense. The fundamental linkage that I like to draw is your lower intensity steel producers use a lot of recycled steel, and this is much less susceptible to supply chain risks, commodity price spikes, carbon programs, than your higher intensity peers. So I, I always like to try to draw that fundamental linkage. Uh, and I'll just say this carbon intensity metric is carbon per ton of production in all cases, and it's something that's curated by our analysts. So it's a pretty, pretty strong data set. And then I'll also add that I expect to see this for the resource intensive sectors. I don't think I expect to see this for like technology or healthcare. And I think that just points to the industry specific nature of ESG, which is why we're doing this analysis at the industry level. Now, let's come to our last question. What drives ESG stock selection? In other words, what drives ESG fund inclusion? And we do this by looking at the correlation between certain ESG metrics and this metric called the ESG fund inclusion rate, which is basically how popular are you in ESG funds. Now, you can argue a greater correlation means, you know, the higher you do on that metric, Sorry, the better you do on that metric, the more included you are in ESG funds, and hence that matters in stock selection, right? If there's no correlation, then uh, I would argue that maybe it, it doesn't matter. Fund managers aren't considering this. So when we ask this question for shareholder rights, you know, does shareholder rights drive ESG fund inclusion? The answer is no, right? There is no correlation between these two metrics. Uh, and it's very clear that a higher shareholder rights score doesn't lead you to be included in more ESG funds, suggesting it doesn't matter. Now, that's a bit of a shame, right? Because we saw in our previous slides that shareholder rights was one of the governance themes that resulted in lower drawdowns. So it does have that performance benefit, but it's not being considered in ESG funds. Now, while this is not being considered, what is considered is carbon ambition. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody, but it's, it's, it's good to put a quantitative figure on this. So you can see about a 42% correlation between our BI carbon forecast scores and the ESG fund inclusion rate. And I'll just mention these scores seek to score a company based on their carbon reduction goals versus a temperature aligned benchmark. So obviously the higher the score, the more, the more ambitious. Now, we can see that this correlation is actually the strongest for steel and cement. It's above 60%, which is quite strong, suggesting that carbon ambition matters the most for these industries. It's less for something like metals and mining. And one can argue here that if you believe ESG funds are going to continue to grow, companies with better carbon ambition can continue to see access to more capital and all this, this wider investor base uh, benefits that we keep saying better ESG will lead to, right? Whereas for shareholder rights, it might not. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'll just go through some quick key takeaways. So what we really used is we used materials as a case study. And uh, in terms of risk and returns, I'll just rattle off the metrics because I think I'm out of time. But we found benefits in safety, strong shareholder rights, carbon intensity, and then when we look at what drives stock selection, it's really carbon ambition, um, not something like shareholder rights, which we found to impact performance. So 
that brings me to the end of my presentation. I'll just add that this is for the material sector, but know that we're going to launch this for a lot more sectors, so a lot more to come. You can find all this on our dashboard, BI Space ESG.